Hi, I'm Caroline, and this is in Hypno. I'm happy you're here with me for this one, as tonight we're diving into the world where memory and desire swirl together, bringing about pure pleasure. If you've been here with me recently, I want to apologize for the delay in dropping this video episode. Yeah, maybe episode is better. Anyway, obnoxiously, I still have a pretty terrible cold, but I finally saw a doctor, got some antibiotics, and I should be on the mend. So thanks for your patience. Anyway, as promised, we're about to set off on a journey into the central realm of memory play within hypnosis, where false memories are crafted, hypnotic amnesia becomes a tantalizing tease, and memory loops turn into our playground. So let's jump right in and begin this seductive exploration where science and sensation intertwine. Ugh, okay, as always, content consent warning. I suppose <laughs> this is a hypnosis channel. It's all about erotic hypnotherapy all the time. So if you're under 18, uncomfortable with pink, you're convinced I'm covertly hypnotizing you through the screen, and that's not something that you'd be into, you should absolutely go and watch something else. With that being said, I'm not now, nor will I ever be suggesting you do anything that's against your own best interest. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Content warning ran over. Let's move on. So now I want you to imagine a world where your memories are as pliable as soap, as malleable as clay, and ready to be shaped into something new and alluring. Something exciting that we can create together. False memories or memory implantation allows us to craft vivid, believable recollections that never actually happened. In hypnosis and in kink, this becomes a powerful tool for role play, for transformation, for desire. So trust, rapport, and mutual consent is as important within this little corner of hypno kink, if not maybe even more important than other areas of hypno play. And I want you to always keep your own comfort and boundaries in mind when, when considering delving into playing with someone or letting someone play with your mind or memories. Always only do what best suits you, what makes you the most comfortable, what turns you on and intrigues you both the most. So here's the twist. Your brain isn't lying to you when it creates false memories. It's either protecting you or following the lead of what's being suggested, or perhaps just recalling the situation incorrectly. So let's discuss a little info on how memory rewrites itself. We like to think of our memories as a vault, each moment stored, sealed, and waiting to be recalled, remembered. But our memories are no more similar to a vault as a game of telephone, like played among 10 people in a super noisy environment is, to a court transcript. Instead, memory is an act of imagination performed in the present. And that's true for everyone. You, me, your neighbor, all of us. Memory is what makes us who we are. It connects our past to our present, shaping us as individuals, determining how we see ourselves, and I guess how we see the world, which is obviously something intrinsically indispensable. However, memories are fickle. Neuroscientific research indicates that every single time a memory is revisited or recalled, it undergoes changes, thus evolving over time. And these changes are nearly always unrecognized unintentional, and harmless. It's a common misconception that our most pivotal memories, like a first kiss, first job interview, the first time you saw your future partner, are perfectly accurate recordings. But they're not. It's not like rewatching a favorite movie. They change. They soften. They sharpen. They seduce. However, I do want to mention that memories that evoke strong emotional reactions are more often remembered and remembered relatively accurately than those that don't involve strong emotion. So each time we remember, we rebuild. We paint over yesterday with the colors of today. And sometimes, oftentimes even, we change the story without even noticing. Cognitive psychologists call this reconsolidation. That's why two people can witness the same event and later swear they saw two very different things. Think about that for a second. 
Every recollection you've ever trusted has been edited by you. Unintentionally, without you even being conscious that you're doing it. So in the 1970s and 80s, psychologist Elizabeth Loftus asked people about car accidents. When she changed one single word, hit to smashed, when recalling the memory, they were called a much more destructive crash. They even specifically remembered broken glass that wasn't there. One word, one suggestion, and the brain filled in the rest. Later, she showed that entire events could be implanted through repetition and social pressure. Being lost in a mall as a child. Hugging Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. Impossible events that people swore were real. It isn't deception. It's a survival feature. The brain prefers coherence to accuracy. It edits for emotional sense, not forensic truth. I remember hearing a friend once talk about a memory that they were so certain of. They told the story often, and then one night with some friends over, he began telling it in front of his wife. At the end of the story, she said, that never happened. And he, of course, argued that she, you know, thinking she was wrong, and she was like, you're an idiot, that didn't happen. And he's like, how do you know? You weren't even there. And she was like, because it's my story. That happened to me, not to you. And he just remembered it wrong. He honestly thought that it was his story and that it happened to him. That's how fickle memories can be. So those same mechanics play out in courtrooms every single day. Eyewitness testimony was once the gold standard. It is now one of the least reliable forms of evidence. Lineups, leading questions, even seeing a suspect's photo on the news can rewrite what a witness remembers. In therapy, too. Well-meaning practitioners once encouraged clients to recover forgotten trauma through visualization. Some memories were genuine, but others were newly created under pressure to remember something. Whole lives have been altered by recollections that felt true, but weren't. So why would the mind risk distorting the truth at all? Because certainty feels safer than confusion. When an experience feels threatening, physically or emotionally, the brain recognizes details to make them survivable. It's not lying, it's stabilizing. Sometimes that protection helps. Other times, it traps us in loops, stories repeated until they harden into identity. Short-term memory, which is now called working memory, is fleeting. Without us actively rehearsing this information, it fades in under 30 seconds sometimes in as little as like six or seven. Our minds can only hold four to seven distinct bits of information at one time. Then the memory either decays or it's transferred into our long-term storage. Our minds are constantly processing pieces of information and what we don't hold on to just filters out like sand through a sifter. Long-term memory is in essence our brain's durable, super spacious archive. And so I guess working memory is the bridge connecting the two. When we store information consciously, actively, on purpose, that's explicit processing. But much of what we store happens implicitly, without us even realizing realizing it's happening. Like, uh, like the anxiety you might feel before a dentist's appointment. You didn't rehearse that. Your body just remembers it. This is where hypnosis begins to matter, so stay with me. Because hypnosis speaks the language of implicit memory. Hypnosis certainly isn't sleep, despite the use as a single trigger word that suggests it is. Instead, it's selective, highly focused attention. The mind filters distractions until imagination feels real. That same focus that helps someone quit smoking or manage pain can also, if mishandled, plant details where none previously existed. That's why ethical hypnotists define the frame clearly. We're exploring imagination. We're not uncovering facts. Without that clarity, a casual phrase, you may remember a time when, can quietly become a new memory that you're certain is real. After deep work, whether therapeutic or erotic, the mind can hold on to echoes, phrases, sensations, triggers. Memory sweeping is the closure that clears those echoes. Think of it as tidying the stage after a performance. 
You keep the insight, the faint impressions on your mind, but you remove the props. In kink, it ensures consent stays active. That everything suggested was temporary, agreed upon, and reversible. A good hypnotist always gives back the subject's agency before the session ends. Okay, <laughs> well, definitely not always. In some dynamics, like 24-7 power exchange, a subject may choose not to reclaim that agency. Hi, that's me, I'm that kind of subject. You may prefer to remain suggestible, to carry certain imprints forward, to live inside the trance, or turn imprints from the trance into a part of your everyday life. And when the choice is made with full awareness, ongoing communication, and explicit consent, it becomes not a breach of ethics, but a deepening of intimacy. The key, as always, is transparency. Not just, did you consent? But, do you still? Not just, are you safe? But, do you feel seen? Are you happy? Are you still comfortable with this? False memory play allows us to craft vivid recollections that never happened. A powerful tool for role play, transformation, and desire. Memory loops deepen arousal through repetition. Hypnotic amnesia creates mystery and rediscovery. <laughs> memory play can completely transform intimacy. I mean, imagine being guided to forget an aversion. <laughs> Think of an experience that really didn't do much for you, or that maybe turned you off instead of off. It only needed to occur one time to become a memory that you clung on to, a feeling that lingered, so let's pretend for a moment that you have a reluctance to, I don't know, maybe performing oral sex, for example. With hypnotic suggestion, that resistance softens, changes. So the act becomes not just tolerable, but desirable. It can be transformed into an activity that excites, arouses, and pleases you. Instead of being reluctant or opposing to engage, you could begin begging for permission. Please let me go. Please, there's nothing I'd love more. And the best part about reworking or reshaping a memory like this one is that within this space, in this moment, something that you truly love doing and can't possibly do so much. Which to me is a win for everybody involved. You're begging to serve or pleasure or please, kissed, not just because they demanded it, but because the body was invited to reimagine the experience, to rewrite the emotional association, to find pleasure where there was once tension. This isn't coercion, it's collaboration, consensual reconditioning of response, a dance of trust and transformation. So what are the pros? Enhanced pleasure, increased confidence, a sense of erotic agency, even a new turn on. And the cons? Well, I can't really think of any, <laughs> but it does need to be reiterated that there is a definite need for crystal clear communication and enthusiastic consent before the session even begins. Possibly multiple times within multiple conversations before a said session, depending on your relationship, dynamic, familiarity with one another. Just really depends on the situation, as all real hypnotic erotic sessions do. So as easy and as sexy as it can be to implant or reshape memories, it can be equally hot and exhilarating to erase specific memories within the trance. You could erase previously used triggers temporarily. You could erase specific scenes such as when your subject was maybe disrobing or when you as the subject was taking your clothes off. Thus, they're suddenly naked and unsure how they got that way or how they got that way. What else? You could make them forget you've had a session at all, or you could be made to forget, which is something a hypnotist of mine used to do. He would fractionate me over and over again towards the end of a trance after reminding me to forget to remember that I've been hypnotized at all during our conversation. Yeah, then fractionate me, then continue just speaking with me normally about one another's days thus far until I couldn't stand it anymore and was just begging him to drop me. Worried that we'd run out of time before getting the opportunity, and so crazy eager to be hypnotized. All the while being totally unaware that I'd already been hypnotized for maybe an hour, only moments ago. 
I don't know, just silly little fun mind tricks like that I've always really enjoyed. And as I know I've mentioned at least once before, even watching yourself in trance later on on video can be erratic and illuminating. It can be a kink in its own right. Seeing yourself engage in something you barely remember, it's like a mirror reflecting your subconscious in motion. Each technique offers a different level of intimacy. Each one re requires trust, communication, and care. So your mind is an author that edits endlessly, and it's up to you to decide if you want to hand over the pen to someone else for a little while to let them write the story. What do you think? Is it something you'd be interested in? I don't know. It seems like a lot of people here love it. A lot of you don't. A lot of you have never tried it. I don't know. Let me know. Next time, we're going to dive into the ethics of erotic hypno, power consent, and fantasy, and how they can all work together to create something truly magical. As always, thanks for being here with me, and I'll see you very soon, okay?